الحمد لله الحمد لله وحده نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونستهديه يا رب لك الحمد كما ينبغي لجلال وجهك ولعظيم سلطانك وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله شهادة قول وعمل فهو الذي في السماء رب وإله يعبد ويطاع وفي الأرض رب وإله يعبد ويطاع وأشهد أن سيدنا وأولنا وهادينا وإمامنا محمد صلى الله عليه وآله وسلم عبده ورسوله وما كان لمؤمن ولا مؤمنة إذا قضى الله ورسوله أمرا أن يكون لهم الخيرة من أمرهم ومن يعص الله ورسوله فقد ضل ضلالا بعيدا أما بعد Dear committed Muslims أيها المؤمنون One of the very important aspects in our lives which happens to be either neglected or forgotten or deliberately excluded from our social consciousness is our relationship, our meaning the Muslims relationship with those who rule over them. This is an area that seems to be either a historical issue some of us are conscious of this particular relationship in the past hundreds or thousands of years ago but we seem to be oblivious of it in our current conditions in our own lives And this is extremely important because the Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him and his forever and evermore. He says to us that if we don't, we as the general Muslim public, remember, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in his book and his prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his teachings said there will come a time and these are ayat and hadiths when we will ask Allah but Allah will not respond to us we will express our dua, but we will see no results to those dua. Awla tad'unnahu fala yastajibu lakum. Or else you will call upon him, Azza wa Jal, and he will not answer you. An ayah in the Qur'an says, this ayah is in Surah Hud 115, وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا 
don't feel cozy with those who are offenders, violators of justice, oppressors. Don't feel comfortable with them. وَلَا تَرْكَنُوا إِلَى الَّذِينَ ظَلَمُوا The way our history developed is that early on, after the 40 years of Islamic governance, what happened after that is we began to see two classes in our society. They're not supposed to be two classes, but that's the way our history has it. One of them is the ruling class, and the other one is the scholarly class. This was never supposed to happen, because if we were living our Islamic standards, honoring our Islamic commitments, the ruling class would have been the scholarly class. And this class of scholars would have been the class of rulers. There wouldn't have been this dichotomy that we are still living with. And there's a hadith from Allah's Prophet that once a person dies, there are three sources, three inputs for ongoing rewards. One of them is وَعِلْمٌ يُنْتَفَعُ بِهِ which means you leave behind, if you were a scholar, if you're a person of knowledge, you're a person of information, pertinent information, if that is passed on after you pass away, then that is a continuous revenue into your investment in Al-Akhirah. The Prophet of Allah, may Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, says, Unsur akhaka zaliman aw mazluma. Come to the assistance of your brother, whether he is a zalim or he is a mazlum. Whether he is responsible for oppression or whether he is a recipient of oppression. Now everyone understands, if someone is oppressed, you come and support him. But how do you support someone who's an oppressor? And so they asked, people who were listening asked, O oh, Prophet of Allah, we understand. If someone is being mistreated, okay, we help them out, or help him out. But if someone is mistreating, how? what does help here mean? He says, the Prophet answer, you bar him from his dhulm. So when you follow these types of ayat and these types of hadiths, that means Allah Azza wa Jal and his Prophet of eternal blessings and mercy they expect us, we the Muslims, to be invested with the power to check the wrongdoings of our decision makers. This is a very serious responsibility that we seem to be neglecting. Granted, among us, there are munafiqoon. That's in the nature of society. That's probably also in the na- in human nature itself. وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَقُولُ آمَنَّا بِاللَّهِ وَبِالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ وَمَا هُمْ بِمُؤْمِنِينَ يُخَادِعُونَ اللَّهَ وَالَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَمَا يَخْدَعُونَ إِلَّا أَنفُسَهُمْ وَمَا يَشْعُرُونَ 
في قلوبهم مرض فزادهم الله مرضا ولهم عذاب أليم بما كانوا يكذبون There is, and the ayat go on. This is at the beginning of Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay, we are healthy Muslims, healthy in our spirits, and healthy in our thoughts. We can tolerate if we are in a healthy relationship with Allah, Tabarakat Hikmato, we should be able to deal with these types of they say they are with us, but in fact and indeed they are against us. Should be as healthy enough as to deal with these types of individuals. But what happens? Why do we have our quote unquote ulama? Why do we have them incapable of dealing with our rulers? Why can't they have enough courage to point out any ruler who is contrary to Allah and His Prophet? We can't expect the rulers themselves to check themselves. There has to be others who will fill in this void. And these others are supposed to be the scholars. This is a very defensive position that Muslims put themselves in because the scholars themselves have to be the rulers. We can't live with this dichotomy, with this schizophrenia anymore. So, it's the responsibility of these ulama not only to point out the tyranny of those who are misruling, but it is also their responsibility to assume that position. In Islam, we don't have a clergy class. And I'm not talking about cultural Islam here and there. I'm talking about the way we understand Allah and His Prophet, the way they should be understood. Think for a moment. Was the Prophet himself a clergyman? Did the Prophet himself belong to a clergy class? Have you ever given it a thought? If you did, you'd obviously obviously know that that wasn't the case. There There were no clergymen, and there was no clergy class. Okay, how do how do we substantiate that? The prophet never had a title as a clergyman. He wasn't referred to with the titles we use today. Because if I become more specific, certain individuals will will turn off. Or they will have their traditions kick in. So I know this, and I'm careful with it. And I don't intend to get on anyone's nerves, and I don't intend to become sectarian. I'm just trying with you with me to be as factual about this as possible. This clergy class is an outcome of European Judeo-Christian history. It has nothing to do with us Muslims. It has nothing to do with us. But power, when people, when empires and when cultures and civilizations and establishments when they have power that power influences those around them or those they who they impose themselves on through colonialism through imperialism and so some of our countries 
and some of our societies began to develop along Euro-Judeo-Christian lines. Let me remind you, there was a nomad in in Arabia over 1400 years ago when the Prophet was there. He came into a setting in which there were men sitting in a jalsa. He said, who here is Ibn Abdul Muttalib? He's looking for Muhammad Ibn Abdullah, the Prophet. He, he, he enters this, let's say there's about 30 or 40, maybe a little more, individuals sitting there. He looks around and he says, who is Ibn Abdul Muttalib? He, what he meant by that, who is Muhammad? If Muhammad stood out as a clergyman, the way clergymen stand out in today's society, he obviously wouldn't ask that. Oh, there he is. I know who he is. It's obvious. He's wearing a amama, he's wearing a this, and he's wearing that, but that wasn't the case. The Prophet was cloaked, was dressed in the same dress that the other individuals was dre- were dressed in. He couldn't, he couldn't, he couldn't, differentiate who the prophet was from the others which meaning which means there was no clergy class you ask yourself then why do we have it if it didn't exist in the time of Allah's prophet why do we have it now Allah's prophet could have easily said oh I know who knows best um, of, among my followers I know the most educated, I know the most sincere, I know the devotees, I know the the honest and all of this. And he could have said, okay, let's distinguish you now because you stand out from the rest. So you should wear a particular type of attire that sets you apart from the rest. It never happened. So equality was part of everyday life. There was no discrimination. People were judged by their actions. You evaluate a person by what he does. What happened? Why did that go? Why don't we have that anymore? The Prophet of Allah says, مَنْ لَمْ يَهْتَمَّ بِالْمُسْلِمِينَ فَلَيْسَ مِنْهُمْ This hadith has two or three other wordings to it. But it means whoever is not concerned with the affairs of the Muslims is not one of them. Why do we have people in today's world? It, it, today's world becomes even more complicated than that. We have a clergy class when we're not supposed to have it. We have a diplomatic class when we're not supposed to have it. We have a scholarly class which we're not supposed to have. And when when, when I'm... I know some of you may be a little confused, but to clarify this, I'm speaking here about decision makers. I'm not speaking about the average people in society. Obviously, you're going to have scientists in society. They're going to know more than the rest when it comes to science. You're going to have people who know more about Islam than others. You're going to have people who know current affairs more than others. But should there be a discrimination? This is the point. If that is the case, and it is the case, should there be a discrimination because of it? And the answer is no. Now, we're going to give an example from the lifetime, from those who learned from Allah's Prophet. The second successor in the decision-making process to Allah's Prophet was Omar. 
Omar is the one speaking just to the average Muslims, to you and me, as it were. And he said something wrong. What he was trying to say was that there should be a limitation on the dowry that husbands give their wives. And a woman, a Muslim, a Muslimah listened to him and what he said. And she quoted the ayah, number 21 of Surah An-Nisa, وَإِنْ أَرَدْتُمْ إِسْتِبْدَالَ زَوْجٍ مَكَانَ زَوْجٍ وَآتَيْتُمْ إِحْدَاهُنَّ قِنْطَارًا فَلَا تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُ شَيْئًا And if you were to substitute one spouse with the other and you gave the first a qintar, it's like saying you gave her a ton of money, فَلَا تَأْخُذُوا مِنْهُ شَيْئًا You're not allowed to take any of that back for yourself. So the word qintar is a word that is unlimited. Just like say, if you give them an unlimited amount of a dowry, you can't take it back. So she stood up and she said, no, you're wrong. Imagine this happening in the world of today, in the real world of today. The highest office, the occupant of the highest office, is corrected by a lady in the audience. What did he say? First of all, he didn't have any guards around. I want to remind you of this because it's very important. Today's rulers, they survive because they have guards. Those rulers died because they didn't have any guards. There's a big difference here. Look at the Arabian Peninsula. I can't help it but remind you, look at the Arabian Peninsula. So what did he say after a woman corrected him? You get upset, get nervous. They say, throw her in prison. They say, sit down, take the mic away from her. There are no mics in that in those days, but in today's world, no, what did he say? Akhta'a Umar wa asabat imra'a. Umar made a mistake. And a woman is right. You tell me. Do we have this type, these types of rulers? A ruler on his way out in his last year, he said, Wadidtu an akhruja kama dakhalt. He said, I wish, I hope that I could leave meaning leave life. I could die the way I entered it, like I was born. لا أجر ولا وزر No reward and no penalty. That's how we were born. And then we have sectarians. They can't respect themselves and they can't read history right. And they try to make him a villain, which is absolutely wrong. They can't read history right and in today's world, they can't read the events of this world right. And the Prophet of Allah May Allah's peace and blessings be upon him, says, لا طاعة لمخلوق في معصية الخالق 
A living being is not due any obedience when he is in disobedience of the Creator. And in another corollary hadith, لا طاعة في معصية and لا طاعة لمن عصى الله There is no obedience due to those who disobey Allah. How many rulers we have today who are disobeying Allah and how many Muslims we have in our world who are obeying those rulers and by extension disobeying Allah. أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم ودعوه سبحانه وأنتم على يقين بالإجابة وتوبوا إلى الله غافر الذنب وقابل التوب شديد العقاب وإليه المصير الحمد لله الذي هدى صلى الله وسلم على سيدنا المصطفى وعلى آله وصحبه أولي النهى وأولي التقى My dear brothers and my dear sisters Now we'll take a look at what everyone does not want us to take a look at. And those are the crimes of our rulers. The criminal personality of those who rule over us. And I want your attention focused on the Arabian Peninsula. We heard from the mouthpieces of the materialistic world, we heard praises for Muhammad ibn Salman, the son of the king of Arabia, virtually the king of all of Arabia. The other statelets are just appendices. One of the songs of praises that they were singing was, look, this person is a reformer. He is giving women their rights. Look, they're beginning to attend certain celebrations and certain parties and certain exhibitions. They're beginning to drive cars and obtain driver's licenses and all of this. That's what you hear from the world that supports him. What you don't hear are women, Saud women, who have this imposed Saudi citizenship on them, who are locked up and who are being harassed, mistreated, assaulted, tortured, and raped. You call these, these are the ones who, you can't argue with them when it comes to Abi Bakrin and Umar and Uthman and Ali. You can't argue with them because they are holier than thou. Okay, you have respect for these individuals? Compare yourselves to them. Did they ever, ever, Assault any Muslim women? Bring us just a little bit of information from your own history books that tells us they did what you are doing. This Tahtani guy, supposed to be the right hand man of MBS, was present as these women were tortured. Why are they being detained and why are they being persecuted? 
because they want to be equal human beings with the rest of the members of society. That's their crime. And one of them says to, to one of, this Qahtani says to one of these detainees, women detainees, I can do with you whatever I want. I can assault you, I can beat you, I can rape you, and then I can cause you to disappear in acid. You don't hear that. You don't hear it from the supporters of MBS, obviously, they want to protect him. And you don't hear it from Muslims. You don't hear it from ulama. You don't hear it from those who are supposed to be speaking for Allah and His Prophet. Why? Ask yourself, why? Only a few voices here and there, that's it. That's what you're going to see. That's what you're going to hear. A few voices in, an, in a population of 2 billion Muslims. You're only going to hear this from a few voices? It caused the governments that support MBS who are playing enemy and friend at the same time, it caused them to be alarmed. Because this is crazy. What he is doing is not within the behavior of average human beings. What does the Saudi government do right now? It tells the Syrians who are living there in its country, in the country that they have colonized, it tells them, bring down your Syrian opposition banners. They have shops, they have homes, they have whatever. And they had foisted on them their flags, which wasn't the flag of the Syrian Arab Republic. It tells them, now you have to bring those down. If you want to put a flag, you have to put the flag of the Syrian Arab Republic. Seems like this is the, uh, the introduction of reopening the Saudi embassy in Damascus. And we ask these Muslims who sold themselves to the Saudis, and we don't ask the average person because the average person is a victim of misinformation. But we ask those who are supposed to know better, their ulama, Syrian ulama, Arabian ulama. What do you say about this now? Explain this to us. The Israelis have inaugurated an airport about 18 kilometers from the Saudi borders. When this happens, all the Muslims should know about it. But why is it one of these news items that very few people know about? And why aren't the ulama reverberating with this information in their khutbas on Friday all over the world because this is a harbinger of things to come and we don't want to react every time something happens we react to it this is the fact of the matter this is the real world this is what's happening and then we say we are brothers of each other muslims every muslim tells you ikhwa. if we are brothers of each other why is it that these rulers in the Emirat, remember the rulers, poor people, they're not saying this type of thing. The rulers, they are saying that the boycott and the sanctions and all of these policies that they set in motion against Qatar are going to continue throughout all of the year 2019. That's a statement that stabs brotherhood in the back. But no one speaks about it. Why? Where is everyone? And then we have Qatar itself. 
And some people think just because we are trying to present information and the facts as they are, that we are they taking side for or against. No, no, no. Our side is always with Al-Haq. Qatar has just increased the taxes on... This is what they called it in the news items, on their spirits or alcoholic beverages, 100%. A Muslim country has alcoholic beverages in it to the extent that the government is going to double the tax on it. Where does this fit into anyone's Islamic mind? Then we have this United Arab Emirates sentencing one human rights activist to 10 years in prison just because he's speaking against the violations of rights in that statelet. 10 years in prison. Compare that with do the comparison. And the Bahraini government, call it government just because they call it government, sentences one of its human rights activists to five years in prison. And the only thing he did was get on social media, just like his counterpart in the UAE, and speak about human rights violations in the country. You put them in jail for five years, and the Muslims are silent about this all over the place, playing politics with it, playing diplomacy with it. What are they doing? And you've heard, probably everyone heard about the Saudi government and Netflix and Hassan Minhaj. A comedian on Netflix pre presents a parody, a comic presentation about the violations of Saudi Arabia and its position in its imposed war on Yemen. And what happened to freedom? Freedom of expression. A comedy, brothers and sisters. This is a comedy. Jokes. They can't tolerate it. They came down on Netflix because they have the money. And now Netflix tells him goodbye. Goodbye. See you later. MBS expresses himself and says that Islamic extremism is a problem of the Muslims. It's an in-house problem. It's an internal problem of the Muslims. And we can only surmount that problem with the help of Western democracies. This is Hami al Haramain al Sharifain. This is the future king, supposed to be, of that Arabian regime. Last week in the khutbah, we told you the son of one of the major preachers in Saudi Arabia, Muhammad al Arifi was taken off of social media and put in prison because they said he is sympathizer with Al-Ikhwan al muslimi Well, for your information, this week they took his father out also. They're one of their major preachers who has 20 million followers on Twitter. What do you say? What do you do? You're supposed to look the other way as if Nothing has happened. And he's the one, the same person, he's the one who said in 2013, what, five years ago, five or six years ago, he was breaking good news to his followers that Bashar, the president of Syria, is on his way out. Now, what does he say? He's silent. 
He told many Muslims to go and fight inside of Syria. In the meantime, he himself was going to Europe, he was going to Turkey, he was having a good time. Zulm catches up with its perpetrators. And this is what we see unfolding in front of our own eyes. There's a fad now in Jordan. We hope this fad becomes mainstream. A Jordanian woman minister walks over the Israeli flag and her popularity shoots up. See the difference between those who rule and those who are being ruled? when there's even a sense of those who make decisions going in the right direction, they become popular. And then at the same time as all of these things are happening in the larger picture, two Israeli ministers put together a party that refuses to acknowledge a future Palestinian state. The United States and the Israelis, the U.S. officials and the Israeli officials, with the beginning of this year, just this week, they abandoned, they left UNESCO, a major organization of the United Nations. Why? Why did you leave? Do the Muslims know? that the United States is second fiddle to the Israelis? And if the Israelis tell the United States Kun to be, then it is. A new law in Jerusalem now, they're trying to put it in effect, and that is they don't want the Muslims to express their call to prayer over microphones in Al Quds. Take the microphones out of these masajid. And one Israeli official says the Adhan sounds, the voice of the Mu'adhan sounds like a wild pig. Adhan is like wild pigs screaming. These are real issues of life that have to be addressed not by ulama by themselves and not by hukam by themselves either by the, the temporary combination of ulama and hukam or by the ulama themselves assuming the position of leadership as should be done. I think we will conclude this khutbah with that and ask of you to think and to think carefully before drawing quick conclusions that are based on suspicion and are based on the accumulation of sectarian history. اللهم أرنا الحق حقا وارزقنا اتباعه وأرنا الباطل باطلا وارزقنا اجتنابه ولا تجعله ملتبسا علينا واجعلنا للمتقين إماما ربنا لا تؤاخذنا إن نسينا أو أخطأنا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا إصرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقة لنا به واعف عنا واغفر لنا وارحمنا أنت مولانا فانصرنا على القوم الكافرين إن الله وملائكته يصلون على النبي يا أيها الذين آمنوا 
صلوا عليه وسلموا تسليما اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد اللهم بارك على محمد وآل محمد كما صليت وباركت على إبراهيم وآل إبراهيم في العالمين إنك حميد مجيد بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم والعصر إن الإنسان لفي خسر إلا الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر ومن أظلم ممن منع مساجد الله أن يذكر فيها اسمه وسعى في خرابها أولئك ما كان لهم أن يدخلوها إلا خائفين لهم في الدنيا خزي ولهم في الآخرة عذاب عظيم إن الله يأمر بالعدل والإحسان وإيتاء ذي القربى وينهى عن الفحشاء والمنكر والبغي يعظكم لعلكم تذكرون ولذكر الله أكبر والله يعلم ما تصنعون وأقم الصلاة وأرحنا بها على 